Thank you, brothers. Good afternoon, everyone. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Numbers chapter 6. Well, I pray this has been a profitable study as we've gone through it. We have a couple of lessons, uh, two more lessons left beyond this one. But tonight we come to the last act of the service. And that is, as you can see from the page, and as you well know, the benediction. We'll talk about that tonight. But I just wonder, as an opening question, uh, as we've looked at each part of the service and walked through and considered and looked in depth at the sections, there's only so many sections in a given service, but looking at those sections, what's been your favorite part and why? Anybody want to answer that? What's really jumped out and, and just made a difference in the way that um, the, the way that we come into God's house? What's made a difference in your worship since we've been going through this study together? Anybody? The I'm sorry? The sermon, Jesus speaking to us. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that's a really important point, isn't it? The powerful point. Like, what was it? The, the second Helvetic confession, the preaching of the Word of God is the Word of God. Powerful truth, right? To receive it that way. Anybody else? What's really made a difference? Jim? The liturgy. God's last words. Yes, yeah, right. The dialogue, right? It's very particular to Reformed uh, theology, Reformed understanding. It's laid out pretty clearly in our Book of Church Order, the Directory for Public Worship. That, that dialogue with God, that's what the covenant. A covenant dialogue, right? We looked at that particularly. It's very, very helpful. Jimmy. In, in, in the order of worship, there's no surprises. Right. You know what you're coming into. Right, exactly. And I think probably all of us have been to services in which there doesn't appear to be a liturgy. Every church has a liturgy, of course, but at least an expected liturgy, and you never know what's next. And how many times, certainly in my own upbringing, you never knew the pastor was going to say, you know what, why don't we do this right now? You know, and boom, you just, whatever came to his mind, and whatever was seemed the next logical step in the flow and the emotion of the moment, why don't we do this right now? And uh, it's very different. And uh, how do you think that affects our children? Having an expected liturgy, you think that's helpful? Right? I believe it is. You know, especially when you, you know, read, uh, we're doing the McShane reading, we've been through Leviticus, right? God had a very structured liturgy for his people for all the years that Israel continued uh, in its existence and the sacrificial and priestly system was in place. Talk about structure, expected liturgy. God said it's to be done this way, not just this offering, but the offerings had to be done just right, or of course they would not be accepted. So the Lord is, the Lord is certainly pleased with, in that sense, repetition, uh, because the gospel never changes, right? So the reality of coming through a shed blood, the shed blood of Christ, of course, uh, is very, very important. What else? Someone else? Ellen? Okay. Yes. Right, right. And, and back that up, not just a call to worship that you hear when you get here, but that's really what brings you here. That's what gets you out of your bed, as it were, and brings you into God's house because God's calling you to worship. In that sense, it's not optional to come to church because God's calling you. You don't have to hear the call for God to be calling you. He calls all of his people. He's done that ever since Garden of Eden when he hallowed the seventh day. Uh, the Sabbath day in that regard. When he hallowed the Sabbath day and made it holy, that's the, that's the formal call to, this is my day, and come to me, and rest in me in it. So the call is very, very important. We're here because God calls us, not because we decide, I think I'm going to go to church today, or I think I'm going to do this, or whatever. Someone else? Sandy. Right. Even if they don't know, they know. Because you know exactly. It's, it's great. Yeah. God, God yeah. Yeah. As I walked back this morning, Matthias was chiming in. Now, blessed be. He, he knew exactly where we were in the service. He knew that was the end. Uh, he knew that's where he could participate. He knew we were. He knew that. You know, up to that point, I was the only one talking. But now the pastor's done, and we all get to say something in response. And Matthias was ready to chime right in and join us. And it's helpful. It's, it's, it's healthy for our children. Our children need to see the parts of the worship. They need to see us as parents responding, participating. Uh, it's no help to our children just to drag them to church, put them in the pew, and don't exemplify participation. And remember, we participate at every point of the service. 
Even if you're quiet at that point, you're participating in faith. Faith is being exercised at every point of the service by all of us in that regard. Very important. Sandy. Sandy. That's right. And it doesn't matter what the Lord wants. Yeah. In the worship. Right, right. We're 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 fundamentally saying no to the world by coming here, right? By coming we're fundamentally because the world is certainly calling us to do a million other things right now. Right? The world calls us to do a million other things on a on a Sunday. We're saying no to that by heeding the call to worship from our Father in heaven, from our God, and coming into God's house and saying, No, this is what God calls me to do, and it's where my heart is. By God's grace, not that there's not a struggle, of course there is, but at the same time, it's where I want to be, and it's where I need to be. Natalie? Uh, I've recognized more how the world calls me to do worship. Like yes. I've, I've spent less time for ranting eBay <laughs> yeah. since I talked about it, just yeah. recognizing the call to worship. Yes, I was wondering if someone was going to bring that up. Yeah, the secular liturgies. All week long, we're being called to bow down and worship this, that, or the other. That secular liturgies, they surround us, calling, calling us away from the Lord. And that's really the Lord's day is a reorientation that we so desperately need. And that comes, comes to play very clearly in the benediction. One more. Somebody else? Arnie. Exactly. Yeah. It's nice, and certainly the church over the last year has learned this, and in many, in many cases the church has you know, stepped up to the plate, as it were. Let's get online. Let's live stream. Let's get an online presence. Uh, we were kind of forced into that as a church. Thankfully, we had all that in place. Uh, but a lot of churches were very just shot out into that immediately because there was no way to reach people because everyone was home. Uh, but the reality was, the reality is, as much as our culture now and, and the evangelical culture now wants to say, wow, this has become super convenient. Think of how many, think of how we can grow our membership. We can have people here and people there and the church, it grows. And that's not what the word says, right? God calls us people to gather and it's not the same. It's nice to live stream to those who are home, but those who are home are missing worship. They're not participating in worship. You can't. You can listen, you can hear the content, as we said before in one of the, uh, the preaching lesson, right? You can hear the content. Online can capture the content, but it can't capture the sermon. <laughs> can't capture Jesus' presence. You can't duplicate that over digital media and put Jesus in your living room, right? The Lord Jesus is meeting his people here in this place. So it's not the same. That's not worship. It's nice to have that outlet when it's necessary, when we're providentially hindered, but we're missing worship. We're not worshiping equally. So we've covered that. All right, well, let's come to the benediction. Now, we've looked at worship over the course of these many weeks, and we've described worship in many different ways. But think of it this way, just by way of summary. In worship, we ascend the mountain of the Lord. Think of Psalm 24. We ascend the mountain of the Lord to have him renew his covenant with us and then seal that covenant renewal with a fellowship meal. Think of the communion as we talked about already. And that meal nurtures and assures us of our place in the covenant through Jesus Christ the mediator. It's in his name and it's through his work that we draw near. And at the end of that worship, now, the Lord sends us away with a benediction. But what is a benediction? Let's start there. What's the benediction? How would you define it? What is it? What's happening? What happens when we worship? What is the benediction? What's going on there? A good word, it literally is a blessing. A benediction is a blessing, right? So we go right to the definition, perfect. Let me ask you this, is it a prayer? It's not a prayer. Do we need more copies of the handout? Barry, maybe can you make a copy? Thank you. So, right, the benediction is not a prayer, right? So why is it that a lot of people close their eyes during the benediction? Now, typically, I don't think we do because you see I don't. Right, I'm looking at you. Try to kind of scan the congregation. Right? We're not to close our eyes. If you want to close your eyes, you can close your eyes. There's nothing sinful about closing your eyes. Right? But the reality is I don't close my eyes to give it because sometimes I'm reading it. I won't remember it in that moment, I'm sure, so I want to read it. But secondly, I don't close my eyes because it's not a prayer. It's a blessing. It's God blessing you. 
And so open your eyes, lift up your heads, and receive the blessing. And so as I said this morning, right, having come into worship, go out to serve with your Lord's blessing. Right? Jimmy, you were going to say something? Well, I was going to say that I don't think many people know what they're doing. Uh, You're right. And where we've gotten away from, where the evangel, you know, in, in the broadly broadly evangelical church, where we've gotten away from a structured liturgy, as it seems that the Lord gives us in His Word, at least the elements of worship, where we get away with that, benediction doesn't make a whole lot of sense, right, to the minds of let's say our contemporaries, and so we get away with that. And what do we do? How do we we replace the the, the benediction with something else? What's it replaced with? Okay, but there's a place for that. We'll come back to that. But what is it typically replaced with? What's that? See you next week. Come back, (laughs) y'all. Right? Right? A closing word from the pastor. Thanks for coming today. Great to have you in worship. Hope you you had a good time. Come back next week. Don't forget. Right? It's, It's something personal the pastor is giving you. Just a note of thanks, a note of appreciation, a goodbye. It's a way to close the service. Or, in many cases, maybe a closing prayer, right? But what they're doing is they're replacing the benediction. They're replacing something that is not equal, right? They can't, they can't replace that. They can't replace what God is doing. And we're taking the focus, in those sorts of settings, we're taking the focus off of God as the one blessing his people and putting it on the pastor as the one greeting his people in some respect, or closing the service. It becomes something very personal. The pastor now is doing something for you rather than being a medium of God doing something, which is the pastor's place, right? The pastor is, holds a ministerial place. He's a, anybody else need a handout? Are we okay? We got enough? So it's not a good word from the pastor. It's not a closing prayer, etc. But Cruz gives this definition in your handout there. It's a blessing from God. Cruz says... In the benediction, God blesses his people by confirming that his name is on them for good in Christ and thereby strengthens them to serve him in the week ahead. So God is blessing you. God is assuring you, however the sermon made you feel, however the sermon maybe rocked your world, maybe convicted you, God is saying, hey, don't forget this. My name is on you. You are my people. I am your God. And God God blesses you, and with that blessing comes the assurance that he's your God. And then he sends you forth out into the world, and you go out in the world with God's name on you. So if we think of the benedictions in Scripture, and think of the benedictions that you've heard, the most uh, most well-known probably here in, in Numbers chapter 6, where the Lord seems to first give this word to Aaron, the high priest, And gives Aaron this direction. So number 6, verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, the priestly family, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them. So this is a way of blessing the people. When Aaron says this, he's blessing God's people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Then verse 27. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel and I will bless them. Remember with God, saying and doing are the same thing. There's no difference. The Lord said, let there be, and there was. So there's no difference with the Lord between saying and doing. So God says, bless the people, say to them, and that having been said, something necessarily takes place. Verse 27, My name has been put upon them, and I will bless them. It's an effective promise. And of course, notice the threefold name of the Lord. Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Now, we're very early in the Old Testament, before the fullness of God's, the revelation of God's triune nature, but it's very, very clear what the Lord is doing here. It's very clear with the rest of Scripture, you're blessed by the Father, you're blessed by the Son, you're blessed by the Holy Spirit. Our one God is triune in His personality. And the Lord is hereby putting His triune name on His people. And this early in the game, as it were, this early in the revelation, rather than Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which you know comes up later, here it is, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Now, 
just because it actually just came to mind, turn to Exodus, thinking of this other very important passage in Exodus 34. I know this has come up many times. It's one of my favorite passages because it's one of the most important passages in all of the scriptures, in all of the Old Testament. This carries Israel. Two things, I believe, carried the people of God. Number one, Genesis 3.15, the announcement of the seed of the woman. That was the covenant promise that carried Israel's hope throughout all their existence leading up to the coming of Christ, Genesis 3.15. The second thing that carried Israel fundamentally, the bases of their theology, of all the Old Testament theology, Genesis 3.15 and Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord passed before him, that is before Moses, and proclaimed his name. The Lord, the Lord, a God, all three. The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. The Lord, the Lord, God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God, and as you go through the prophets and you go through the Psalms, all the, all the talk and all of the, the reaching back and, and expressing dependence. Oh Lord, please forgive us because you are steadfast in your love. You forgive iniquity. You forgive transgression. You forgive sin. You keep steadfast love for thousands. What are they doing? They're going back to this. This carried Israel as it should carry us. So, so when we look at the benedictions of Scripture, it becomes clear then that the Lord is blessing His people. Now, besides the blessing God put upon our first parents in the garden, in the covenant of works, again, the most popular is number six. And you'll notice that it is Aaron doing it as the priestly family. And because with God's name comes God's blessing. That's the key. Right? What's in a name? Well, it depends on the name. But more importantly, in God's name, God is giving himself. That's the key. His blessing necessarily follows his name. When once the name of God is put upon you, the blessing of God is yours. Again, because saying and doing is the same thing with God. So we see then that the benediction is a ministerial act done at God's command in which His blessing and favor are, are truly and really being put on His people. Right? So having said that, why is it then that uh, in the OPC, Ruling elders and licentiates, as Derek was when he was laboring here, or interns of that sort, cannot give the benediction. Why aren't they allowed to give the benediction in the OPC? Ruling elders, if they were to lead the worship or even preach, or when an intern and licentiate is up here ministering, why can't they give a benediction? Why do they close in prayer typically? Or Derek got into the habit of actually reading a doxology. Right? Which is different, not a benediction. So why can't they do that? Why don't we allow in the OPC either ruling elders or licentiates to give benedictions? For right. God. Okay. Right. It's a ministerial act. Right. God gave these instructions through Moses to Aaron and his sons. Now remember, you had Aaron and his sons, the high priestly line, and then you had the Levites who came alongside and served Aaron and his family. They served the priestly family. So. But it was to Aaron that this charge was given, bless my people. Now turn to Leviticus 9, verse 22. This is very important. It's after all of the instructions for the various offerings are given. And then in beginning in chapter 8, you have the consecration of Aaron and his sons. So you have the consecration of the high priestly family being set apart to offer all of these offerings for Israel on a regular basis. The Lord accepts Aaron's offering in chapter 9, and he goes through and offers these various offerings. The Lord accepts it because he does it according to the rule, according to God's word. Verse 22 now, Then Aaron lifted up his hands toward the people and blessed them. What did he say? Numbers chapter 6. That's what he said. He blessed them, and he came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offering. And then Moses and Aaron went into the tent of meeting, and when they came out, they blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Of course it did, because the blessing of the people is effective. 
for Aaron to raise his hands and to announce to the people the blessing of God, to give God's name, well, you can see immediately God shows up. Because what is the giving of the name of God but the giving of God? That's what's happening. God's being given to his people. He is coming upon his people with blessing. So that's why the minister at that point would raise his hands. And again, here again, we see that it's Aaron who's charged to do it. Not the, not the Levites. They ministered to the priestly family and served and helped with the taking down and the setting up of the tabernacle and all of that. But Aaron, Aaron alone was given the charge to bless. And so in the OPC then, as our director for public worship makes clear, the licentiates are not allowed to give the, the, uh, the closing benediction, nor are ruling elders. And that's why typically in those cases, it would be a closing prayer. Or again, Derek started reading doxologies. Now a doxology, what is a doxology? We sing it, but what is it? It's a blessing of God. Right? Now blessed be the Lord our God. And so we can chime in at that point, and that's a rightful thing for a licentiate or an elder to do. Let's, let's, praise, let's close by offering praise to God. We do that together, right? But at the benediction, the minister has a role, a representative role to say, now the Lord blesses you, right? So that's why that is in place. New Testament letters, of course, are often concluded with some sort of benediction. Let's turn to Romans 15, 13. We'll run through a few of these examples. So Romans 15, verse 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that the power of the Holy Spirit, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. A wonderful benediction, a blessing, right, centered on hope. Right? Turn over to 2 Corinthians 13, 14, which of course is the most familiar for a New Testament benediction. And this, of course, in one sense, this is really the the essential replacement for the ironic blessing in number six. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord. Right? Now, we know who, now we know God's names as it were. Right? Revelation is, has, has become much more clear. We're into the New Testament. The Lord, the Lord, the Lord is nothing other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Turn over to... 1 Thessalonians 5, which you read this morning, it's a wonderful one. 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 23 and 24. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do it. Right? So notice what's being said in these benedictions, right? Pro the promise of God's blessing, the assurance to you that you are blessed, the testimony that God is doing something. Right? That God is exercising himself toward you. He's engaging you with himself and giving you, bringing you blessing. Turn over to Hebrews, of course, typically after the Lord's Supper. I'll use the one from Hebrews 13. It's very appropriate, of course, after the Lord's Supper, after communion. Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, whom be glory forever and ever. You got 1 Peter 5, verses 10 and 11. Typically this one is used after the professions of faith. Those people coming to join the church, and after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Notice that. There's a benediction joined with a the doxology there in a sense, right? Notice the verse 11. That God, to God be the praise for blessing his people. And then, of course, interestingly and wonderfully, yet not surprisingly, the whole Bible closes with a benediction. Revelation 22, 21, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. Right? The Lord bless you. How about Jude? Jude 24 and 25. I was going to ask you if this is a benediction, but you all, you all have your, your uh, cheat notes in your Bible. It says doxology above it. So I can't really 
It's not a fair question, is it? Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. It's a wonderful, beautiful doxology. But you can immediately tell the difference, can't you? Between that and the benedictions that we read. Because this is a praising, and it's an exaltation of God, which obviously that's His due, and so we have a place in our service for a doxology. But it's not a benediction, and yet this is often used, I think, confusingly by many ministers. This is what closes the service, a very, very common one. Um, and it's not really a benediction. It doesn't give that same assurance. It doesn't come with that note of God is blessing you and sending you out. It's an exalting of God, which is wonderful, but that at the close of the service, a benediction is more appropriate. Now, all of these, we can go through, and there are others in Scripture, of course, um, in the New Testament, I mean, but there's all of these are di- reflect and are directly tied to the blessing which the ascending Christ put on His church once and for all. Look at Luke 24, verse 50. If anything, this is where the benediction in the New Testament comes from, not just from Aaron, but it comes from the fact that these were Christ's last words. This is what Christ did. And now as the heralds and messengers and representatives of Christ in his church, that is ministers or the apostles immediately, we're following Christ's example. So if you will, at the, at the close of Christ's ministry, analogously then at the close of our worship service, Christ blessed his people. So here we have the ascension described by Luke very briefly in Luke 24 verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple blessing God. Now that's not a coincidence. Jesus is doing exactly, intentionally doing exactly what Aaron was told to always do. He's showing himself to be the high priest. It is Christ who blesses this church. And he lifts his hand as Aaron was told to do. And he's putting his name on his church. He's blessing his church and he's sending them forth. Closing his earthly ministry and sending them forth, in this case, up to Jerusalem to receive the power from on high and the Holy Spirit. And he's blessing his people. So this is really the pattern that's being followed in in worship services. (coughs) Christ blessed and now ministers bless the church. Now let's think about this practically. We talked already about, and we were reminded even Uh, tonight about the secular liturgies that surround us, the calls for worship all week long. Worship this, bow down to this, live for this, work for this, right? Give yourself to this, yield to this, let everything fall to this, make this the center and the hub of your life. Let everything fall to it. All week long, in the same respect, the world is giving us names. Some names are, might be that we're Maybe you're called rich or fat or ugly or smart or funny or idiot or stupid or not good enough. But on top of that, not only is the world giving us names, but we can give ourselves names, right? Our own sinful heart. You're not good enough. You'll never measure up, right? And these names can beat us down, right? They can really beat us down. And we can forget in a long, hard week. We can forget who and whose we are. We can forget our name. We, we can forget that we belong to the Lord, that the Lord is with us. We can forget that God's blessing is upon us because we don't feel blessed at all right now. As we go through our week and things are topsy-turvy and things are a mess and everybody seems to be against us and all is beating us down and we can't please anybody. We can't, we can't ever get it right. Nothing's gone right this week. Chaos, a mess. How does that make us feel sometimes? It is hard to get up and keep moving. It is hard to to feel good. Well, what happens then when God brings us into worship to renew his covenant with us by which he's made himself our God and he's made us his children? God doesn't send us out from worship without reminding us of our name. I think this is, in one sense, this is really what's important about the benediction. It's not just that you're being blessed. Yes, it's that, and that's critical. But the Lord is naming you. He's sending you out with a name. Because you're going to go into the world that's going to counter that, that's going to come against that in every possible way. 
And again, our own sinful hearts chime in, especially when we're confronted with our failures and our weaknesses and our sins. God wants to remind us of our name, and he does that by reminding us that we're named after him. You see, by giving his name to us in the, in, in the benediction, God has constituted a new name for us as well. And all in all, this is our new name, blessed. Right? Think of the Beatitudes, blessed. Think of the, the psalm, blessed are those whose God is the Lord. Blessed is the heritage of the Lord. Blessed is Israel. Think of even what we sang tonight. It comes from the Psalms, of, of course. Glorious things of thee are spoken, O Zion, city of our God. You are the city of God. You are the people of God. Blessed are you. And this is what God says to us at the close of the service. This is how God sends us out. Blessed are you. We're chosen. We're children. We're beloved. We're redeemed. We're saved. We're covenanted. We're happy, we're secure, we're safe. What does this do for a what? What does this do for the whole identity crisis? Who am I? What am I? I'm a child of God. I'm the people of God. I'm the church of the living God. God has set me apart. This is the idea of sanctification and consecration. Remember, Aaron had the name of the Lord, holy unto the Lord, on his turban, set apart to God. All of the holy things were set apart by anointing and by blood, by oil, set apart, belong to the Lord. We've all been set apart. That's who and what we are. That's who and whose we are. Cruz puts it this way, I think. This might have been actually Michael Horton. I mean, I, but it's probably just Cruz since I didn't put Horton's name. A major point of the worship service is to teach us who we really are. So now let's walk through the service very quickly. Think of this. A major point of the worship service is to teach us who we really are. We are those who are called by God out of sin. There's your call to worship. We are those who are cleansed by his gospel and freely forgiven. That's your cleansing section, right? Confession and pardon. We are those who are led by his word. That's the preaching. We are those who are invited to feast with him at an eternal meal. That's the communion. If all of that doesn't work to reorient us entirely, if that doesn't teach us that we belong to Christ and not, and not to our sin, not to the devil, not to the world, that we have been set up, if that doesn't correct our thinking and reorient it and realign us and make clear to us that we have been set apart unto God, we have been distinguished, we are not of the world, we are of the Lord, then the Lord seals it all off. He does one final thing. He gives us his name. You're blessed. You're mine. I'm yours. How encouraging is that, right? Have you ever been in a church that doesn't give a benediction and felt weird about it? It's strange when the service doesn't end in that way, if you're used to it, especially. More importantly, if you know what's, what it's doing, right? What the importance of it is. And the church just ends kind of suddenly. It ends maybe with a prayer. It ends with, see you next week. How different is that, right? Where's the assurance? Where's the comfort? Where's the encouragement? Where's the seal? The last word is God's. And of course, you know, the two stanzas we sing afterwards is your response. Yes, blessed be the Lord. Now comes the doxology. The doxology through him. Blessed be the Lord who has blessed us, right? It's the proper response. But God gets the final word, really, doesn't he? Because he sets the stage for our response. God gets the first word, and he always gets the last word. His first word is his apostolic greeting, which again, licentiates and, and, and uh, uh, elders do not give as well because it's a ministerial act. So God gets the first word in the apostolic greeting, grace and peace to you. He gets the last word in the benediction. You're mine, I'm yours. Wonderfully encouraging. But it's also important to point out, and I'm sure you've already thought of this, that the benediction isn't the first time that Christians receive the name of God. We receive the name of God at first in our baptism, don't we? Right? That's the, that's the doorway into the church, at least. As we're born into the covenant community and are thereby members of the church of the living God, our baptism recognizes that membership. And what happens in baptism? God puts his name on his people. We heard from Malachi chapter 2 this morning, right? The Lord blesses the families of the house of God because he wants a godly offspring. Those children are God's. 
Our children are God's children first. He has caused them to be born in this community, in this church, out of these wombs, that his house might have godly offspring. And so the Lord calls us then to put his name on them. We have that, of course, in Matthew 28. But turn to, turn to what we looked at this morning in Matthew 19. We got into this in the Sunday school just briefly. Matthew 28, 19, right? I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one name of the triune God. And so God's name is put upon us. His blessing is given to us. And that's what's important about what Jesus does when the little children are brought to him in Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. Again, we read this in Sunday school. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, let the children, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Now it does confirm in Luke that these were indeed infants in arms. And of course, you can understand the, in one sense, as, as William brought out this morning, you can understand the apostle stance. Well, they can't hurt, they can't understand any of Jesus' teachings. Well, how can they benefit from, from the teacher, the rabbi? But they are benefiting, they are blessed. They belong to the covenant community. They belong to the Lord. And so here you have the head of the church. You have the king of the kingdom of heaven blessing them. He's putting his blessing on these children. And as is made clear in our baptism liturgy, in one sense, this is, if you will, this is a proof text for what we do in the, in the baptizing of our children. We're putting God's name on them because that's what Jesus did and that's what Jesus showed us to do. And then that's what he said to do as he was charged his disciples. So when we're baptized, we're brought into the covenant name of God. And when the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts, we receive all the blessings that come along with that in their fullness. And of course, God is sovereign over those in whom his wor he works saving faith. But the important thing to realize is that God brings us into his covenant community by distinguishing us from the world. So there's a distinction in the fact that these children, our children are born here and not out there. That they're born into that institution, the church of the living God, that institution in which we have membership. And thereby they immediately enter into membership. Because as you know, baptism doesn't make our children members. It recognizes the membership that God gave them by giving them to us in this house. and making They're born into that. Think of slavery, right? In slavery, children born in slavery are automatically slaves because the parents were slaves. They were born into it. They didn't have a choice. Well, how gracious of our God to cause us to be born into membership. So when we baptize our children, we're following God's command and we are putting his name on our children because they are blessed and will be blessed. Will that blessing extend to eternal saving faith? That's God's sovereign pleasure and not ours but we have a responsibility and we have a privilege. A privilege to raise them in the house of God, whereas we talked earlier with regard to the liturgy and everything else. They hear the gospel, sing the gospel, remember the gospel, and sit under the preaching of the gospel, which no one out there is getting. But all who are born in here are getting. What a privilege. And so to go to the back of the church and have Matthias chime away, well, before you know it, Matthias is going to be doing more than just saying a few words. He's going to be singing the whole thing. Lord's Prayer, doxology, those things that we do repeatedly as a, as a congregation in worship, our children catch on to that and they learn that. And it, becomes, it becomes an orientating device. It becomes an anchor, an anchor of worship, an anchor within worship. So there's a privilege and now there's a responsibility to raise our children as even again Sunday school hit on this morning, raise our children as God's children. He, he looks for, as we heard from Malachi 2, he looks for a godly offspring. So we raise our children for the Lord and remember that they are his. Talk about proprietorship, right? They are his. We are merely stewards of those children who carry our name. And they carry our name, praise God, but they carry God's name, more importantly. So God distinguishes our children by having them born here. And then he says, distinguish them publicly. Not just by the fact that they were born in church and go to church, but by putting my name on them. And then they're raised, being called to heed the call of God, to heed the initiative of God, 
to embrace the God who came to them and took the initiative with them in their youth to embrace that and to respond to the call of God with, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, I'm yours, right? So if we have ears to hear it, God is reminding us in the benediction that we belong to him, that we have his name upon us, and that just as we are his, he is ours. Isn't this how the, how the law begins? I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, the house of slavery. I'm your God. By implication necessarily then, you're my people. That beloved verse in the Song of Songs, I am my beloved and my beloved is mine. That's the benediction. So in closing then, the benediction is God's way of sending us into our week with the assurance of his blessing upon us. We are not alone. We are not to go out of this place and try to put anything into practice in our own strength. The benediction reminds us that we don't go out of here alone. Whatever the Lord has charged us with or laid upon our hearts, whatever conviction has taken hold of us, and we know we need to go forth and we need to put things into practice, we need to give ourselves to the gospel imperatives. Well, not in your own strength you don't. And God wants to, you to remember that. In fact, we're not to live a single day of the rest of our week without finding comfort in the reality that the blessing of God rests upon us because the God who blesses us is with us, right? Think about that. We are to know as we go out of this place that the blessing of God is upon us because the God who blesses is with us. Because this is the reality. God's benediction is an effective effective promise of blessing because it's a giving of God himself to us. That's what it's doing. God is saying, I am going with you. I am taking you out to this, out of this place, through those doors. I'm taking you into your next week. I'm with you. My blessing goes with you. That's fundamentally and essentially who you are. Don't forget it. Don't let the world take that away from you. Don't listen to your own sinful heart. Don't listen to all the people who accuse you and bully you and whatever it may be. Don't listen to any of that. Go with this truth. I'm your God. You're my people. And let that be your comfort and your encouragement. God's steadfast love is what enables us to be steadfast in our clinging to him. So you can see the benediction has an important place. It's not just a formal way to close the service. It's very, very important. And you can see why it's reserved in our denomination. It's reserved for the minister because it's a ministerial act representing God. God is doing something radical and important. Amen? So we've gone through every part of the service as far as the sections go. What we haven't covered is singing, which we'll cover, Lord willing, next week. I wanted to try to bring both of these together, but it would have made too long of a lesson. But we'll cover next week. We'll look at singing. And the reason singing was put last in Cruz's book is because, as you well know, singing kind of peppers the whole service, doesn't it? Right? So it's not in a section like all of these other parts that we've looked at. It really fills the whole service in far, as far as our responses throughout the, the points of the service go. So we'll look at that next week, and then we'll close uh, in the following week, Lord willing, with the final lesson, uh, the final chapter of the book, which is preparing for, participating in, and profiting from worship. A lot of practical advice on preparing for the Lord's Day. And, uh, and making it in intentionally preparing your heart, your mind, your body for the Lord's Day so that you can get the most out of worship. Because if this is what happens when we worship, then it takes, as our, as our confession makes clear, it takes due preparation, right? We should, there's nothing more important that we should prepare for better than the Lord's Day and worship in God's house. Everything else, you can pull yourself together and out the door in just a few minutes but not worship, not God's house, not God's presence. I think one of the most memorable, one of the most marked things is that Israel was told to prepare for three days, three days before the Lord appeared on Sinai. Three days they had to prepare themselves to meet with God. I don't think we start preparing on Thursdays. Right? We hardly prepare on Saturdays or Saturday nights. But the point is, preparation is necessary, and a lot of times... When we don't get anything out of worship, it's because we didn't prepare ourselves. It's really our own fault that we just weren't ready. And therefore, it just went right over us, as it were. It passed us by.